question. So before we go any further, let's just notice that in terms of bias, in terms of conflict of interest, we're talking about a man who is paid big money for the killing of babies. And it's no surprise that he's uh, not a fan of the centers who are uh, providing information that is gonna dissuade some from going down that route. It's directly damaging his business. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of About Abortion. Uh, my name's Dave Brennan, thanks so much for tuning in today. Please do just take a moment now to subscribe, uh, to share this with others, and please feel free to add comments, uh, and in particular, like the video. Apparently that really helps just to get the, the video to feature more highly in people's searches, and that helps us to get the message uh, to more people. That'd be so fantastic if you could do those things. Uh, in today's episode, we're looking at the BBC Panorama uh, hit piece on uh, pregnancy centres that took place last week. And I'm asking the question today, how should we respond? Um, there's been a fair bit of analysis going around, and we're going to be doing a bit of analysis uh, today of what happened there. Uh, but I want to step back a little bit from uh, just detailed analysis and look at the question, how should we respond um, actively speaking? What should we do next uh, in response to what's gone on? Um, if you haven't seen uh, the program, uh, please don't worry. I, I hope this will be of use because really we're looking at some, some key areas that this, this whole thing brings to the surface for us, uh, which apply uh, to gospel uh, work and pro-life work more generally, um, and really to, to what's going on in our nation morally. So don't, don't um, worry if you haven't seen the program. Uh, it, of course, would uh, require you having a TV licence. As I heard a certain Scottish pastor say recently, he doesn't have a TV because he tries to avoid propaganda wherever he can, and he certainly doesn't like to pay for it. I have to confess, I'm of very much the same persuasion, uh, so I'm not even going to recommend you go and uh, see it. But um, uh, we trust this will be of, of help to us today. I want to open with these words from Matthew's Gospel, uh, which I hope are going to set the tone for us as we consider how should we respond uh, to this. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then in the parallel, passage in Luke's Gospel, Jesus uh, goes on to say this, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. And we could perhaps look at um, Acts chapter 5, where we find the apostles uh, rejoicing that they've been counted worthy of suffering for the name and that they carried on preaching the gospel. We could look at Philippians, where uh, what was, I would say, quite clearly a form of attack on Paul. He ended up in prison. Um, he said that turned out for his deliverance and served to advance the gospel. We could think uh, of the beginning of the book of James, where we're commanded to consider it pure joy when we face trials and, um, and troubles of various kinds. We're going to be looking later on in this episode at some of the um, details of this kind of hit piece, um, what was, what was uh, claimed and, and what we make of those claims. Um, but I want to begin by looking at the reality of spiritual attack and how we need to respond to spiritual attack. And I want to say that this is 
uh, a form of spiritual attack. That's a big part of what's going on here. Um, clearly, the abortion lobby is getting nervous. We're really sensing that uh, in many different ways. Um, because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade in particular in the States, um, the abortion lobby in this country is getting very nervous. The, 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 the temperature has gone up in terms of um, buffer zones. We've talked about that on this program already. And uh, they're desperate to get information, support, and in fact, options, choices away from women who are pregnant and in a difficult situation and are considering abortion. They don't want anyone, uh, even praying silently, um, to, uh, to help uh, those women or to um, be any kind of influence or presence at all. Um, so we're seeing that the temperature going up with buffer zones. Um, we're seeing uh, certainly um, in some of our work on the streets, we, we find, well, on the one hand, we've got more and more people saying, we love what you're doing, thanks for what you're doing, um, you know, and, and showing a real interest and openness. We're also seeing in various cities in the UK the, um, the persecution uh, increasing as well. So th the other side is certainly getting um, nervous. And when I say the other side, of course, crucially and most importantly, what we're talking about here is not flesh and blood. We're not talking about human um, enemies here. Uh, we don't, you know, in a sense, we don't have human enemies. We, we love all people. And what we perceive is the enemy, the true enemy um, behind uh, the scenes, as it were, um, the one who has taken people captive to do his will. And Satan loves child sacrifice. He's always hated God and he hates the image of God. And he's always been very keen um, on the blood of innocent uh, people, especially babies. Um, we've talked about this again in other episodes. You can go back and listen to uh, them if you're interested in, in, in really what... Um, abortion is in terms of child sacrifice and how Satan loves child sacrifice. He's got a real interest in it and he doesn't want it impeded in any way. So Satan is very nervous about the growing strength and enthusiasm, uh, confidence of the pro-life movement in this country. We're right at the beginning of this and we're in no, in no way at all at a point where we can rest on any kind of laurels. But there is a growing movement. We're seeing more people get involved in our education work on the streets. We're seeing more and more churches beginning to speak out against this. We're starting from not just zero, we're starting from something in the negative, um, but there is positive movement. So the other side is getting nervous and hence this attack. And so what happened here was um, BBC uh, almost certainly commissioned informally in some way by the abortion lobby. I mean, it's not difficult to see that just reading through the BBC's own kind of uh, article on this. We'll get onto that later on. But uh, essentially the BBC put up to it by their uh, friends in the abortion lobby um, went undercover into uh, 57 pregnancy centres. These are uh, crisis pregnancy centres that the terminology uh, you know, varies, but essentially these are broadly speaking, and I'm saying broadly speaking because of what I'm gonna have to talk about in just a few moments. Broadly speaking pro-life, um, they are not providers of abortion or indeed of anything, particularly medical. Some uh, provide ultrasound, um, but they are there to give information and support to women who are considering abortion. And uh, obviously the abortion lobby is very nervous um, about what these centres are doing. Uh, they, they are aware, no doubt, that uh, many babies have been saved uh, through the work of some of these centres. And so they undertook to try and uh, bring them down. They've done this before, a number of years back, uh, something called the Brook Report. Um, they, they managed to uh, cause quite some disruption at that stage, and, uh, and so here they are having another go. How should we respond? Well, what we've seen in these uh, brief scriptures that I've shared is, well, firstly, we need to rejoice, actually. You know, it's very easy to, to get the sort of victim mentality and think this is a terrible, um, uh, a terrible sort of outcome for the centres. But actually, if we're being attacked and we've done nothing wrong, and as we'll see in a moment, they, they've done nothing wrong, the ones that are being attacked, uh, we can surely rejoice. Rejoice because we're counted worthy. If we suffer persecution because of righteousness sake, we can rejoice. Jesus commands us to rejoice um, because we are following in the way of the prophets 
and great is our reward in heaven. And, um, you know, if, if we were doing um, everything that Satan wanted us to do, he would never attack us. There'd be no point in him attacking us. If, if we find that we're never experiencing persecution um, or spiritual attack, uh, in fact, that's when we should be very worried. But if we are being attacked, uh, we can take it as a compliment that we're doing something right. So we can rejoice and we should rejoice um, and we should carry on. In the passage in Acts chapter 5, um, the, the apostles straight away carried on preaching uh, the gospel. They were not in any way intimidated by um, the powerful Sanhedrin and others who were seeking to persecute them. It's very important, and this is, if, if this is ever listened to by any of the, the centres that were getting it in the neck from the BBC, um, just want to encourage you, don't back down. It's very tempting uh, after being smacked by something like this to want to tone things down, uh, to want to try and avoid um, to, to, to avoid the, the, this happening again. And that is what happened a few years back with many centres. Some uh, ceased, others um, w wanted to become more camouflaged, uh, more like uh, the NHS and the abortion providers, so as to avoid the same thing happening again. But we mustn't back down, we mustn't change our tune um, because uh, of uh, the sort of music that the BBC is demanding. So we've got to remember who we're playing for. We've got to rejoice and we've got to carry on. Don't back down. In fact, if anything, press on all the more because the other side's getting nervous and that's because good things are happening. Um, but I want to now talk about the other side to this. Um, and really, I am actually very concerned by some of what this um, panorama investigation found. I am actually really concerned by some of the practices going on in some of these pregnancy centres. And I'm not going to be all defensive of the centres because they're, on the, they're meant to be on the pro-life side. Um, because actually there's, there's something that's very troubling about what was found here. Now, it's not what the BBC thought were troubling. It's not what they thought was, was unethical or, or bad practice. Um, but there was one stat in particular in, in the piece, which we'll link below, um, the BBC's kind of write-up article on this. There's a stat there that I found really troubling. They, they asked 57 centres, uh, sorry, didn't ask them, they, they went undercover and asked them questions and did interviews and so on. Of those 57, more than half, so 34, more than half um, signposted, uh, when, when giving information about abortion, whatever, they signposted the women to the NHS website and to other abortion providers. So they, they, they commended the NHS website and abortion providers as accurate, presumably unbiased information to the women who are coming to them. More than half of these centres were commending, were sort of um, uh, normalising and implicitly um, uh, commending the websites of abortion providers. Now, I find that deeply troubling. If you go to the NHS website, go to the, you can do it right now, go to the um, pages that purport to describe abortions or go to any of the um, abortion providers and go to the pages that claim that they are giving descriptions of abortion and you will find that the so-called descriptions are woefully, woefully dishonest and insufficient. In, in many cases, they will not mention the baby at all. Uh, they won't even use the word fetus. In many cases, they just talk about it being a pregnancy. And this is just a way to end the pregnancy. That is not accurate information. That is not helping someone to understand the reality and majesty of the life in their womb and the horror of what abortion, so-called, does to that baby. The, the abortion providers um, will try to avoid the, the, the reality and that by their own admission, we're going to see that in a few, few moments as I take you through some of this, this so-called investigation. By their own admission, they conceal the reality from the women who are pregnant. They conceal the reality of the life in their womb. They conceal the reality of the horrors of abortion and its effects. 
So the fact that more than half of these centres actually signpost women to these providers, even if it's just for information, to me is inexcusable. I mean, imagine if you, um, if you were living in, in say, the Netherlands um, or, or in Germany in, in the 1930s and 40s and, and you had a friend, uh, a next door neighbour, say, who, who had some Jewish friends and they didn't know what to do. Do I hide them? Do I help them to get to a different country? Um, would you say to your friend, well, hey, I, I actually know some people who, who are really helpful with, with um, solving Jewish problems. You know, I'm going I'm to signpost them to the SS. You know, let's, let's just give, let's give them a call. They'll, they'll know what to do. They, they deal with uh, Jewish people. They, they know how to solve this problem. You would ne if you had any concern um, for the welfare of Jewish people, you would never refer people to the Nazi regime to say, well, look, they, they deal with Jewish people and they're the official authority on all of this. And, you know, so let's, let's keep it official and we'll refer, we'll refer you to the SS. They'll, they'll know what to do. Now, you might balk at such a comparison, but we're living in an age when the government is, is, is paying for and the NHS is providing the killing of innocent human beings. And our number now is more than 10 million. We've, we've surpassed the abortion, sorry, the, the, the Jewish Holocaust numerically. We, we passed that many years ago. We're on 10 million. Just because it's the official NHS website doesn't mean it's right, doesn't mean it's uh, uh, factually correct, nor does it mean it's morally defensible. And therefore it's indefensible to point someone in the direction of the NHS website or other abortion providers um, saying that that's going to give them the information they need. So that's actually the thing I found most troubling about this whole investigation is that more than half of these centres are actually pointing uh, women back to the providers, the ones who, who intend to harm their baby, well, harm, harm the women in many cases, but to kill the baby. As Christians, as those who purport to be pro-life, how can we point them in that direction? Now, of course, those 34 out of the 57, they, 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 um, they avoided the um, criticism of the BBC. They, those, those are the centres the BBC is quite happy with. So they, they didn't get it in the neck. And perhaps they're sighing, sighing uh, relief as a result. It's almost like a sort of um, demonic Passover that we're seeing here. As the BBC passes around these uh, pregnancy centres. As long as they see the blood of innocent children, the blood of child sacrifice wiped on the doorpost, as long as they can see there's no hindrance to child sacrifice here, they'll pass by. They, that's fine. That, that won't incur their wrath. But if they see a doorpost that's clean of the blood of innocent children, if they see a doorpost where uh, the, it's clear that child sacrifice is being hindered by truthful information, by support, by the facts, well, they're going to go in there in all their wrath and, and inflict uh, such punishment as they can. And so whilst to, to the centres who are getting it in the neck from, from the BBC panorama, my encouragement would be rejoice, be glad, carry on. To the centres who actually got the pat on the back or who are left alone because the BBC was quite happy with, with what, what they were doing, my message would be, Woe to you. And, and, and actually, whilst um, Jonathan Lord, who I'm going to talk about in a few moments, uh, said he found the results of, of, of some centres extremely troubling, what I find extremely troubling is uh, the results of the centres that they thought were fine because they're just pointing people back, perhaps out of a fear of being persecuted, perhaps as a result of the, the, the last round of, of, of um, hit pieces, um, the Brook Report and so on, a few years back. I can put a link to that under this video. Perhaps they, they have um, been persuaded um, by who knows who to, to blend in to the abortion providing culture and give that so-called unbiased um, advice, uh, essentially pro-choice advice, suggesting 
um, that abortion is fine if that's what you want to do. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. And uh, perhaps you're listening to this and you're aware of a, a pregnancy centre. Uh, maybe there's one uh, attached to your church or, or in your area. Maybe your church supports a pregnancy centre. I want to just um, plant the question for you. Uh, do you know what's going on in your local pregnancy centre? Do you know which side of this line it's on? Is it on the side where the BBC says, no, they're fine. They're pointing back to the NHS website. They're not in any way giving information um, that could dissuade someone from having an abortion. Um, they're playing ball, we're happy with them. Uh, or uh, is your local centre the kind that's going to get it in the neck from the BBC because they're standing against the grain, uh, going against this narrative. Uh, they're showing the truth and they're um, challenging this idea that killing a baby could ever be called healthcare. So does your local centre or the centre that you're supporting, does it pass the BBC test or does it pass the biblical test? Can I encourage you not to assume um, where your center is, uh, but ask the question, ask, ask how, wh what is the advice, the information they give? There's no way through to the end of abortion other than the way of persecution. And this is something we need to be reconciled to and perhaps this is why the pro-life movement in the UK is still so small uh, and why so many churches still don't want uh, to get involved. Well let's just turn to some of the details, don't want to get lost in the details today but let's just look at some of the details of what came up in this um, panorama investigation and I, I want to keep the focus on um, some of the bigger things that we need to be paying attention to as God's people, as those who are uh, looking to see an end to this. Um, some of the issues in culture that we see um, coming through in this piece but have also made their way into the church and we need to be careful uh, and vigilant on this front. Uh, I believe it was C.S. Lewis who said the most dangerous ideas in a society are not the ones that are argued but they're the ones that are assumed and in this piece um, which is linked below um, we see some of the ideas that are assumed um, that are extremely dangerous. They're not really argued as such, but they're assumed. Okay, and one of the um, assumptions that I want to uh, point out here is this, the sort of myth of neutrality. This idea that um, the NHS and the abortion providers are um, sort of, they're sort of neutral. They don't have a, a view, they don't have a, a, an ideology they're just providers and, and they, they, they would never try and steer a woman one way or another and it's just up to her. Uh, by contrast, it's these anti-abortion centres. They're, they're, they're bringing their morality into it. They're imposing their faith on people. Th this myth of neutrality needs to be uh, blown out of the water because even if it were true that uh, the stance of the abortion providers was we're just simply here to give the woman what she wants, uh, so we're not trying to steer her in, in any way. Even if that were true, that is not morally neutral. It is not morally neutral to accept a status quo uh, in which unborn children are not protected from acts of violence. That's not neutral. Allowing an act of violence is not neutral. If, if someone was beating their wife and the response from a neighbour was, well, it's not up to me whether he beats his wife or not, it's his wife, it's his decision. That would not be a morally neutral response. That would be a negligent res response. It would be an evil response. So even if it were true that they were uh, neutral in that sense, that that's not being morally neutral. That is an act of evil to encourage, um, even by silence, um, acts of violence. But what we're going to see here is that, that, that that's not even the case. It's not that they are uh, just there to support the woman whichever way they want to go. They are clearly pro-abortion, they're not pro-choice. So um, having said that, let's just look at um, some of the ways in which, even by their own admission, these um, uh, the abortion lobby who were behind this piece are anti-truth. They do not want women to see the reality of life in the womb 
and the reality of what abortion is. So in the program, um, one uh, uh, Joe Holmes, uh, who is um, clearly pro-abortion, one of the three so-called experts in the show, all three of them, of course, were abortion advocates or providers. Um, she said early on in the show uh, to Jonathan Lord, one of the other so-called experts in, in the Panorama uh, program, she said, it's not a baby when you've got a choice. It's a pregnancy or it's an unplanned pregnancy or it's a, an unintended pregnancy or it's an unwanted pregnancy. She literally said that the essence of what's in your womb depends on your feelings. It's not a baby if you have decided you don't want it. Imagine if you apply that to something else. Again, imagine the, 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 the example of domestic abuse, spousal abuse. It's not my wife, she's not my wife, if um, I don't want her to be my wife. Um, instead, she's a punch bag because I've decided that I don't want her to be my wife. What we want does not change reality let alone what's morally um, permissible. But that's what they literally said in the show. And these are the people who are supposed to be the experts. These are the ones who are, are meant to be in contrast to these so-called unhinged, um, you know, these supposedly unhinged uh, anti-abortion pro-lifers. Literally said the essence of what's in the womb has changed because of thoughts and feelings. And really hand in hand with that is this aversion to the use of un ultrasound. So uh, one or two of the centres, not many of them, but some centres do use ultrasound. And uh, Jonathan Lord, one of the so-called experts, uh, said that this is intrusive and it's manipulative uh, because it can cause guilt. He says ultrasounds can be helpful but, uh, in a pregnancy situation, but in some situations it's intrusive and it can cause guilt. Now this is remarkable. He is trying to discourage the use of ultrasound in pregnancy and trying to claim that women should not be even given the option to see their baby. Now, if you go on the uh, TPAC website, Tyneside Pregnancy Advice Centre, this is one of the centres that really got it in the neck, it says on their own website, uh, in terms of what they offer, we offer a free ultrasound for those who want to see their baby. Okay, they're not forced to see it, but they're offered it. So, so this is on their website. Um, there's nothing manipulative about offering someone to see the truth. What is manipulative is hiding the truth from people. And again, this myth of neutrality, they wanna say that um, seeing a baby could cause guilt. Well, yes, seeing the reality that there's a life in your womb and therefore this so-called abortion procedure is actually killing a human life, that is going to touch the conscience. And that's absolutely appropriate that it should. But think about the flip side. If they're saying this can cause guilt, well, why are they withholding information? They're withholding the truth because they don't want people to feel bad about an act of violence against an innocent human being. They're trying to numb the conscience. They're trying to um, pull the wool over their eyes. That's what's manipulative. And yet the BBC has opted to be on the side of the anti-truth, um, deceptive abortion providing lobby and against those who simply want to reveal the truth and offer support. So this is a, by, even by their own admission, um, these, these abortion providers, the abortion lobby are anti-truth. They do not want women seeing, seeing the reality. And this is very much hand in hand with the whole push for buffer zones. They do not want information reaching the eyes and ears of these women. They don't want support uh, reaching them. They're not pro-choice, they're pro-abortion. And this is being exposed more and more uh, in recent months. Uh, Joe Holmes also says uh, the, the language is used to make the client feel guilty. This is language like baby and descriptions of the abortion procedure. Again, what's the flip side of that? By their own admission, the abortion lobby is using language that will try to normalize and make morally um, uh, palatable uh, this this procedure, which is actually an act of violence. Uh, also in, in the uh, BBC article, which kind of lists some of the findings of uh, the so-called investigation, um, they mention uh, three areas in which uh, they're accusing some centres of misinformation. 
okay? So not only is the um, use of ultrasound apparently unethical and manipulative, uh, but there are three claims in particular that, that the, the investigation found and, um, and want to make out as, as, as being unfounded. So the, the first is that, um, is that abortion can cause something that's sometimes called post-abortion syndrome, essentially mental distress, mental health problems. Uh, essentially, it's a kind of trauma. Um, and they are claiming that this is a condition the NHS doesn't recognise. Now, that might be the case. The NHS may not recognise it. Of course, the NHS is not the infallible source of all truth. They're certainly not telling the truth um, about abortion. Um, but it's undeniable. There are so many studies. I'll put links to some of them below here. And I know people who've had this, who've had post-abortion syndrome. It is a, a very common experience of many, many women who've had abortions and even men who've, whose children have, have been killed through abortion. It's very common and it, of course, stands to reason. It's a deeply unnatural and invasive act that ends the life of your own child. Of course, it has an effect on your mental health. It's not rocket science why that would be the case. And there is so much evidence out there that it does, but they, they want to claim this is fear-mongering and manipulative and unfounded. The second claim they uh, mention is the fact that abortion can cause infertility or can cause problems for future pregnancies. Now, they claim uh, that uh, the NHS and others say this is not the case, but if you actually look on the NHS website uh, listing abortion risks, it's quite interesting. Um, the NHS even has to admit there are significant risks attached to abortion, but in a kind of dis in, a, in a very dishonest um, sleight of hand, they want to try and have it both ways. So they want to say this: uh, abortion does not risk um, have any any impact on your fertility. But then they list all the ways in which there can be complications in abortion, and then later on they say if there are complications in abortion, it may have an effect on your fertility. So do you see they're trying to have it both ways? What they're essentially trying to say is, if there are no complications, this won't affect your fertility, which may be true. But there are so often complications. And if there are complications, it can affect your fertility. So even by their own mission, if you kind of read through the, the way they're trying to wriggle around this, it can affect fertility. And again, loads of studies on that. I heard a, a, a gynecologist from the States, Professor uh, Cahoon, Calhoun, who, um, who treats difficult pregnancies. He's seen hundreds, probably thousands, I think, of women in problem pregnancies. And he sees a measurable and significant difference in terms of how he has to treat these pregnancies. Just as a, he's not talking about morally, just medically, those who've had abortions, there are significant risks, in particular of your next uh, baby being delivered preterm and all the risks associated with that, significant. And I'll put some links in below. So, it's it's not a false claim. It's true that abortion can affect fertility and future pregnancies. And then the third one, it, this is the one where the, 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 the room always blows up if you ever even sort of suggest this connection, uh, abortion and breast cancer. And um, this, is, this is meant to be such a ludicrous claim that if you even suggest the possibility of a connection, you're an anti-science fear mongerer. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into the details here, but let me say this. It's actually uncontroversial to say that abortion sometimes increases the risk of breast cancer. That's actually uncontroversial. There's total um, scientific consensus about that because if your first pregnancy is interrupted for any reason, so if that's natural miscarriage or abortion, if your first pregnancy is interrupted, as in doesn't end with a live birth, that increases your risk of breast cancer. And many women, uh, when they have an abortion, it's their first pregnancy. So again, you might try and wriggle around it, but it's actually uncontroversial, that in, at least in some cases, it's uncontroversial that abortion increases your risk of breast cancer. So these three so-called outlandish false claims are not false. Even according to mainstream accepted science, they're not false. So this is a kind of a, a post-truth, anti-truth kind of um, attack on, on uh, 
the, the very reality, the fact of the matter, because abortion, when seen for what it is, protests itself. And its effects on women, of course, are negative. Because it's the most unnatural thing in the world to break entry into a mother's womb and to kill her child. This is the reality of abortion. And uh, the abortion lobby know that the reality of abortion is very damning. And it doesn't serve their purposes well. And so they, they, they want to try and demonize those who are showing the truth. Um, so that's, that's kind of the post-truth um, side of things. I want to just touch now on um, their so-called experts and what they're really made of. So um, let's just take one, for example, Dr. Jonathan Lord. He's one of the three so-called experts brought in to comment on the ethics and practice of these pregnancy centers. Now, he is um, the head of Mary Stokes International, MSI Choices, um, one of the main abortion providers worldwide. And it's quite interesting to note their ethical um, sort of uh, CV. Now, of course, the most important thing we must never lose sight of is these are genocide perpetrators. They are killing thousands of babies um, every week worldwide. Many abortions they're performing are overseas using UK taxpayers' money to perform illegal abortions in countries in Africa, for example. In many countries where abortion is illegal, MSI is performing abortions. Okay, these are um, people who profit from abortion. So before we go any further, let's just notice that in terms of bias, in terms of conflict of interest, we're talking about a man who is paid big money for the killing of babies. And it's no surprise that he's uh, not a fan of the centers who are uh, providing information that is gonna dissuade some from going down that route. It's directly damaging his business and his prospects. Now, there's more to say about this man. Um, I'm gonna to link to a, an article below if you want to read more of these details. Uh, but he's actually um, facing uh, demands for, for investigation himself for giving deliberately false information to the NICE, to the GMC, and to the general public. Lies about abortion pill reversal. Um, abortion pill reversal is where if you've taken the first abortion pill, you can take this pill, which is essentially progesterone, and uh, that will, in many cases, in about half, I think, of cases, uh, that can save the life of the, of the baby. And Jonathan Lord has, a, a I would say, a clearly demonic um, hatred of this treatment because it saves babies' lives. And he falsely claims that it has risks uh, to the mother. He falsely claims that it doesn't work. Uh, he even falsely uh, tries to claim that if you've taken the first abortion pill, and you regret it, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to get a, a pill reversal. Just do nothing and the baby will be fine. That's a lie as well. That will in many cases lead to the death of the baby. This is a man who is ideologically committed to the death of babies. And he doesn't want any route out available to women who are even thinking about going down the route of abortion. Now, so he, he, is, uh, he uh, has, has given out false information, about trying to claim that abortion pill reversal is dangerous. Uh, he instigated a campaign against, against uh, Dr. Um, Dermot Kearney, um, uh, who's a wonderful man who's, who's seen a number of babies saved through abortion pill reversal. Um, and he, he instigated this, this smear campaign to try and get his uh, license revoked and so on. Now the GMC has vindicated Kearney and said he's been guilty of no wrongdoing at all. He's not given false information. He's not coerced anyone. Uh, he is squeaky clean. And yet still Jonathan Lord is pressing on, trying to campaign against abortion pill reversal and against Kearney. He even went, this is Jonathan Lord, he even went to the point of harassing a vulnerable woman in a crisis pregnancy to get her to testify against Dermot Kearney. He even called her on her personal phone this is Jonathan Lord harassing young vulnerable women to get her to testify falsely against Kearney to, this, to the extent that she blocked his number. And then on the same day, he emailed her to try and get her. And in that email, he lied, saying that other women have already come forward giving testimony and would she do the same? That was not true. So this is a deeply, deeply unpleasant man who is um, prepared to lie, prepared to intimidate, this is real harassment. 
going after a young woman when she clearly doesn't want to be contacted. And yet they have the audacity to claim that it's these centres who uh, don't stand to gain financially from abortions in the way that Jonathan Lord does. Um, he, they, they have the audacity to claim it's these centres who are being manipulative and harassing and so on. Now, it's worth noticing that in, in recent years, twice the CQC has found MSI to be deeply wanting in their own conduct. In 2017, uh, they were found to be paying bonuses to their staff for persuading women to have abortions. So that, that was like a target that employees had and they would have a financial incentive to get more babies killed. Um, and uh, it was found that they had in their business plan um, the uh, DNPs that did not proceed uh, people. So women who were thinking about an abortion and didn't proceed, um, they were going after these women again, calling them, trying to get them to uh, arrange another appointment again. Imagine if the pregnancy centers were doing that. Imagine if a woman went out of the center saying she's gonna have an abortion and the center kept calling her, trying to bring her back. There's no doubt the BBC would have found that to be uh, extremely troubling and unethical and so on. But this is what MSI does. They have a financial incentive for those who persuade women to get abortions. They go after the ones who did not proceed. In 2016, CQC found there were more than 2,600 serious incidents in MSI clinics around the UK. They were failing basic safety procedures. This is Mary Stokes International. No wonder Jonathan Lord was all too keen to jump in on this smear campaign and try and suggest it's these pregnancy centres who are being unethical. I, I can well imagine he wants to divert the attention away from his own personal conduct and the failings of his centres. Even aside from the killing of babies, the CQC's um, assessment of them, I can only imagine uh, too easily why he's keen to do this. So there's just one example of these so-called experts, deeply troubling people. Um, but we mustn't get hung up on these ad hominems. It's important to notice what's going on here. Um, the BBC is trying to launch a massive ad hominem against the pro-life movement, essentially um, say that we're such bad people doing such bad things, therefore, and they, again, it's not what's said out loud, but the implication is abortion is fine. The thing you really need to be worried about is these anti-abortion activists who are so inappropriate, so unethical, so biased, etc. Now, I'm not here to defend the pro-life movement. And it's important we don't, that, that's a wrong way to respond to this program. We mustn't get caught into answering bad questions, okay? Yes, we wanna uh, write the record, but the reason it's wrong to kill an innocent human being is not because these centers are doing a good job. And it's not because Jonathan Lord is a nasty man. That's not what makes abortion wrong. What makes abortion wrong is it's the killing of an innocent human being. And so let's not stop at these ad hominems. Let's not get caught up on them. This whole program is not an opportunity to vindicate and, de and defend the pro-life movement. It's an opportunity to, to expose the horrors of abortion. Abortion when seen for what it is, protest itself. Now, as I uh, begin to come in to land, I want to bring, uh, the attention now really onto um, the culture in the church. Because some of the problems I've, I've highlighted here, the myth of neutrality, the sort of post-truth um, mentality, and um, the, the reality uh, behind these so-called experts and, and the danger of getting drawn into ad hominems and a kind of who's who personality politics. Many of these problems have infiltrated the church and it's actually a problem with the way we think inside the church. And I just want to um, close really by, by looking at a couple of those things briefly. I found that in the UK church, when it comes to abortion, many churches, many church leaders, their instinctive reaction is to think not first of all of the horrors of abortion and of the danger posed to babies within their own congregation and in their local area and, and what's experienced by the women and the help they need. For many, their thoughts instantly go to PR. It's about what will people think of us? 
if we talk about this issue. How does this reflect on our um, reputation and what people make of us? Personality politics, um, we've talked recently on this program about uh, seeker sensitivity, how people perceive us, not wanting to offend people, trying to blend them with the culture. These sorts of things have really invaded a lot of the UK church. And we are more troubled by being seen as one of the bad guys by mainstream culture than we are by the horrors of child sacrifice in many cases. And even those who say they're pro-life, even those who say they're against abortion, if you look at it more closely, they are often more troubled and horrified by the idea of being on the wrong side of mainstream media and culture um, than they are um, being found supportive or, or just inactive when it comes to abortion. Let me give you an example of this. Think about how evangelicals in the UK respond to Donald Trump and how they respond to Joe Biden. I have found that people get extremely animated, many Christians get extremely animated about how much they dislike Donald Trump and how eager they are to make sure you know they are not a, Do a Donald Trump fan. They, 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 don't, they wouldn't be seen dead uh, supporting him in any way. They, they're very, they, they're not um, quiet about this. Uh, there, there's no ambiguity. They're not politically neutral. They don't um, leave it to your imagination. They're extreme, they, they, they all jump on. There's like a pile on. And I've been in so many situations like this with relatives, in churches, uh, Christians, and get, including some who, who are, would, would say they're pro-life. They're so enthusiastic <laughs> to, to make sure you know they do not like Trump. But when it comes to Joe Biden, normally there's basically nothing to say. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us they are more concerned with what they perceive to be personality than they are with policy. And it also shows that their affections are being directed very powerfully by mainstream media. Because look, the reality is this, quite aside from personality, Donald Trump has helped to roll back an international genocide, measurably. Joe Biden is trying to increase an international genocide. Recently on Twitter, he said, if there was an attempt to, um, to, to put a federal ban on, um, on abortion, I would veto it, okay? What he's saying is he would use his special presidential powers to ensure that babies are still being killed in his nation. And these same Christians who want to jump on the pylon uh, and, and say how much they hate Donald Trump, None of them have got anything to say about Joe Biden using his presidential privileges to protect a genocide. They're not interested. Just doesn't, that just doesn't register for them. What does that show us? It shows us that narcissism, and it is narcissism, people not thinking, people not even uh, wondering whether I might like Trump, people, that is more horrifying to me. It's more horrifying to me that people would think I might be tolerant of Trump uh, than, than people thinking I might be tolerant of baby genocide. That's the kind of thinking that's invaded um, the church. And, and we've, we've allowed ourselves to be distracted from the main thing, which is, in, is in, with, with the baby genocide, the main thing is the morality of the baby genocide. And we've gotten really distracted on uh, the optics, what people think of us. This is not a time when we need to be thinking about uh, people feeling good about us. This is a time when we need to be feeling bad about abortion and we need to help society to feel bad about abortion. Now that's not about condemning people because the hope of, of the gospel is, is strong enough and good enough that there is hope for anyone who believes. Okay, there is repentance, there is the offer of forgiveness, but we need society to feel bad about abortion, not feel good about us. And that's a decision that lies before us as the church. And it connects to another thing, and this is the final thing I want to really talk about, which is what is our authority? What are we listening to? What's directing our responses? Now, again, evangelical Christians are going to tell you it's the Bible. They're biblical. And, and they may well think that. And in a sense, that may, that may be true. 
but what are the authorities that are truly directing our affections? I've just spoken about the fact that most UK, I mean, look at Evangelicals Now, um, uh, one of the main uh, Christian newspapers in the UK. So often you see uh, pieces in their letters in there talking about how much they, um, they, they want to slate Donald Trump and they give Joe Biden a wide, wide berth. It's really common. Now, what's going on there? Yes, in a sense, these people may well sincerely be biblical. That's their authority. But what's really going on is their affections, their thoughts, their attitudes are being directed by the mainstream media. And so we need to be thinking about some of the authority bases that have for us become idols. OK, sometimes it's the mainstream media, sometimes it's the BBC. Sometimes it's the NHS. We think the NHS is not only the authority on, on medical, but on ethical issues. Have we fallen into expert worship? Do we believe the experts are the only ones qualified to speak on moral issues such as abortion? Do we trust the government implicitly? Or do we turn to, for example, the BACP, again I'll put a link below, um, the, the, the sort of authority on counselling and psychotherapy, they tell us what makes good counselling. They set the rules. They, they tell us that we're meant to be so-called neutral non-directive, that we just do whatever the mother, the mother thinks best, that's right for her. Now we might think that we, we're, we're immune to this because we're Christians, whatever, but notice the way we behave in the church. I've spoken to many churches on abortion uh, and there are many more churches I've not been able to get into. And there are many, many churches where um, they see that any issue like abortion or IVF or whatever, they delegate that to the doctors in their church. They think the doctors are going to be the moral authority on these ethical issues because they're doctors. Now, doctors certainly know a great deal more than I do when it comes to the medical stuff, but does that make them more morally uh, or ethically authoritative? Now, the reality is, and we've got other episodes on this, in particular the 1965 uh, Abortion Act um, piece, but also looking at the history of the evangelical movement in four books. Um, I can put links to those below as well. Um, we've got a history in this nation of subcontracting our morality on this issue to the medical professionals, even in the church. Now, a Christian doctor may have very clear thinking on this issue, or they may not. In fact, there may be a great danger that they are, um, they, they've been compromised on this issue, or there's a temptation for them to be compromised on this issue. They may be less well-placed than others to speak clearly, ethically on this issue. There may be a conflict of interest. Their profession could be on the line if they speak and stand clearly on this issue. So are we turning to doctors in the church to be our moral authority on ethical issues like abortion rather than scripture? Because actually the scriptures are sufficient uh, to give us moral guidance on this issue. Um, think about the way churches responded uh, to lockdowns and masks and vaccines. We allowed other authorities to tell us what loving our neighbours looks like. Think about, um, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a, a young woman I spoke with who had just been through training in one of these pregnancy centres, uh, which used the, the, the secular, pro-choice, non-directive model. The first thing she said to me was, well, you know, the most important thing is uh, if a woman came to us and then, you know, whatever we showed her, whatever we said, persuaded her not to have an abortion, so to have the baby, and then later she regretted it, wouldn't that be awful? Wouldn't that be the worst thing? That's literally what she said. She was so indoctrinated. This is a Christian lady in an evangelical church. She was so indoctrinated by the pro-choice, non-directive ideology that was being taught by her Christian pregnancy centre that she thought the worst thing in the world, the worst outcome would be if a, a woman was persuaded to keep her baby and then regretted it, which by the way, virtually never happens. No, virtually never happens that someone regrets having their baby. The converse so often happens. Now it may, may seem I've, I've gone a long way here from BBC Panorama, but what, what this raises for us and highlights to us is a number of different areas. What's our authority? Do we implicitly trust the experts? Have we believed a myth of neutrality? Are we people of truth? And are we um, steering clear of personality politics and getting drawn into um, uh, being obsessed with our optics and how people see us? 
rather than going the way of righteousness. So friends, things are going to continue to get hotter. The abortion lobby is not going away. They're not going to go away quietly. Satan is raging against those who are seeking to expose the deeds of darkness and stand for righteousness and truth. Those who want to get between him and the blood of these innocent children. The, the divide is going to become more and more stark. Those who want to stay in the middle, those who want to be camouflaged and stay sort of neutral or keep out of trouble, that's going to become more and more untenable. And, and there's only really one of two ways that, 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 that we have before us. Either we go the way that wins the approval of the BBC and keeps us out of trouble so that a panorama hit piece will never come knocking on our door, or we go the way that pleases God and we accept all the persecution that comes with that. that those are the only two choices. And I think that, that things are become more and more polarised and those choices can become more and more stark. But that's what lies before us. Let's see this hit piece as an opportunity to count the cost, clarify which side we're wrong. And if we've um, been blessed enough to be persecuted for righteousness sake, let's rejoice and let's carry on.